Hello, everyone. My name is Dennis Simon. I'm the executive director of the Center for Innovation Policy here at Duke University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, to this webinar entitled Research System Integrity and Security Implications for U.S. Innovation Performance. And uh, this is part of a series of programs that we've been doing over the last year and a half. Uh, dealing with uh, different aspects of the U.S. innovation system. Uh, this one in particular uh, is driven by uh, the emergence uh, during the Trump administration of a document called NSPM 33, uh, which is a document that has directed all agencies and entities that receive uh, significant federal research funding uh, to strengthen and standardize their disclosure uh, requirements uh, for receiving federally uh, funded awards uh, from the government. And uh, it, it mandates for various uh, entities like universities, uh, the establishment of research security programs uh, so that uh, they can uh, provide the necessary oversight and enforcement activity uh, to make sure that there aren't violations of both the integrity and security of the U.S. research system. Um, our program today is co-sponsored by a number of other organizations at Duke, including the Office of Research and Innovation, uh, the uh, Certificate in Digital Intelligence Program, and the Stanford Cyber Policy Program at the Stanford School here on the Duke campus. Um, we are very fortunate to have with us uh, two very superb guests uh, who have long extensive experience in this area. Uh, first, let me introduce Dr. Laura Weiss. Uh, Laura is the Senior Vice President for Research at Penn State University. Uh, at Penn State, she oversees the research of 12 academic colleges, seven interdisciplinary research institutes, the Applied Research Lab, which is a university uh, research center affiliated with the Navy, and offices for sponsored research, research protection, industrial partnership, tech transfer, economic development and commercialization. I'd like to ask Laura when she sleeps, I wonder. <laughs> um, uh, she is uh, also the president of the Penn State uh, Research Foundation. Uh, Laura, uh, prior to coming to Penn State, spent 13 years at Georgia Tech where she served as the senior vice president and director uh, in term of the Georgia Tech Research Institute. Laura received her PhD in acoustics from Penn State her master's in mathematics from UCLA, and her bachelor's in mathematics from Boston University. Our other uh, panelist is Dr. Kelvin Drogemeyer. Uh, Dr. Drogemeyer served as uh, President Trump's science advisor and led OSTP uh, in its coordination of several important science and technology uh, initiatives under the federal government. He also served for about three months in 2020 as the acting director of the National Science Foundation. He is a, an experienced expert in the study of extreme weather, numerical weather prediction, and data assimilation. Before joining the White House, Dr. Drogemeyer served as the vice president for research and regents professor of meteorology at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, where he had joined the faculty in 1985. Dr. Drogemeyer uh, earned his BS in uh, meteorology from the University of Oklahoma and MS and PhD degrees in atmospheric sciences uh, from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. So I will uh, start off the program uh, by asking each of our speakers to provide uh, uh, some initial comments of about five to 10 minutes. Uh, then I will provide a series of questions for them uh, for the next 20, 25 minutes. And then for the final so, oh, so 30 minutes of our program, um, we will uh, get uh, questions from the audience. I would uh, encourage the audience to use the Q&A function to submit questions. And uh, I will try to get to as many of those uh, that you provided as possible. And I'm sure that uh, our speakers will be more than gracious to try to answer all, all your questions uh, as you throw them out uh, on the table. Um, and in the end, if we have a few minutes, we'll give each uh, speaker uh, time to make a closing uh, statement uh, of uh, a minute or so. So just to bring closure uh, to the entire event. So without further ado, let me start off with Dr. Weiss. 
uh, give her the floor and then we'll go on to Dr. Drogomeyer. Laura? Dennis, thank you. And thanks everyone for joining this call and giving me the opportunity to be here with you. Um, so I'm gonna start with some opening comments and I, I do look forward to the Q&A session. First and foremost, we have to remember open scientific and scholarly collaboration between scholars from all over the world is one of the cornerstones of innovation and technological advancement. And we as universities, Penn State included, remains committed to fostering such collaborations. We know that over the past several years, the federal government has increased its attention to academic researchers' engagement in and affiliations with foreign countries due to concerns about inappropriate diversion of intellectual property and threats to the security of the United States, um, and especially the funded research from foreign competitors. Th this is gonna be, I think, a cornerstone of the conversations we'll be having today. We talk a little bit about research security, but also about the research integrity. And so when we talk about that inappropriate diversion of intellectual property, that, that really is an important piece of what we're trying to um, make sure, in, instead of doing it inappropriately, we do things um, appropriately when we start um, trans translating some of that in uh, intellectual property. I just want to remind that everyone that the vast majority of international affiliations at university, they do not present a security risk. There have been cases at some universities in the US here where researchers have violated laws and policies that are aimed at preventing lapses in research security, but that is not you know, the majority of our faculty. We really have some incredible faculty collaborations that are underway around the world, and it is critical that we preserve those relationships. Um, you heard from, from Dennis in, in the introduction about the, you know, some of my background, and I do want to just comment at Penn's, about Penn State a little bit. Penn State is a land-grant university. It's a member of the Association for Public and Land-Grant Universities. It is a member of, the, um, of AAU, the Association of American Universities, and it is a member of the Big Ten. So we are a big place. We have about 75,000 or more undergraduates. Um, we have about 15,000 graduate students, 15,000 students on the world campus, 6,000 full-time faculty. We have 24 campuses across the state of Pennsylvania. 96% um, of residents in Pennsylvania live within 30 miles of a campus. Um, and we do a large, we're an, we're an R1 university. We do about a billion dollars of research expenditures um, every year. So, so we're a big complex place. And so being able to um, manage and work through some of the, the, the new um, directions that are coming out of the federal government, everything from NSPM 33 through the, the open sharing, the, and we'll talk more about this, you know, the data, you know, how do you um, provide data openly and freely to, to everyone um, while also remaining compliant with NSPM 33. Th those are some of the conversations we'll have. The point um, I was trying to make here is, is that we're a big place. And so when we start um, rolling out some of the practices that get aligned with some of these new policies, we have to really be deliberate um, and considerate of, of all of the, the um, employees, faculty, students, postdocs, um, that we are that we are affecting as we create these policies. So they have to really be deliberate and, and thought through um, as, as we roll them out. I'm, I'm sure we'll have plenty of time for more time to take a pause there, but thank you again for having me here today. And I'll turn the mic back over to you, Dennis. Thank you. Great, super. Why don't we move on to Kelvin then? Well, thank you so much, Dennis, and good morning and afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and Dennis, uh, Duke is so fortunate to have you, and, and I'm just completely honored to be uh, on the panel with Dr. Weiss. She's a real luminary and uh, uh, just a, a great leader in the community. Uh, I do want to just say quickly that uh, I am consulting formally for NSF, and some people might know that. I'm not wearing an NSF hat today, so uh, uh, when I do that, I'm a special government employee representing the federal government. That's not what I'm doing today. I'm a professor here at the University of Oklahoma and former OSCP director. Um, you know, as Laura said, you know, openness in the research enterprise is critical. And we faced risks and challenges uh, ever since the days of the Manhattan Project. And of course, it was basically put in an isolated place for, for obvious reasons. Uh, and, and the academic research enterprise at that time was completely different, you know, funded mostly by philanthropy and tuition dollars and so on. And a lot changed uh, after World War II when Vannevar Bush's treatise uh, got published. And basically one of the hallmarks of that was uh, bring all of this benefit of the research that was being done there out into the open for the value of open society. And uh, since that time, uh, so-called NSDD 189, the National uh, Security Decision Directive 189 in 1985, has basically been the North Star for how to deal with some of the challenges that we're going to talk about today. 
Um, basically, the idea was it, the, the way to protect information that needs to be protected is to classify it. Otherwise, let it be completely open. Uh, and back in those days, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, the risks were much smaller uh, than they are today. And openness and investments were quite large. Uh, and, and everything really could be open if it wasn't classified. But things are quite a bit different now. The risks are very substantially greater. They're more multidimensional. And also the investments are quite a bit smaller by comparison. And also issues of human rights uh, and, and those kinds of things uh, really are, are certainly front and center, uh, surveillance, coercion, things like that. Uh, and and we've, we've seen this recently in other countries, not only China, but Russia, Iran, and North Korea uh, represent uh, existential kinds of threats in various ways. And, and so, you know, when you think about our research enterprise, um, it's, it's again, it's very different uh, than, it, than it has been in the past. And of course, there's a lot of interest, as Laura said, in, in this topic. Uh, but universities are not sitting on their hands. And this is something when I was at OSTP that I think the sense was, well, universities, they don't take this seriously. Uh, that's certainly not true. I know Laura could uh, opine a lot on what Penn State has already been, been doing, as well as many other universities. Um, so there's a lot of activity going on. And when I was at uh, OSTP, we created this thing called JCOR, the Joint Committee on the Research Environment, which basically focus on all dimensions of the research environment, whether it's safe and inclusive research environments, whether it's diversity, whether it's uh, rigor and integrity, or if it's if, if things like uh, administrative workload, those are all really critical things that all intertwine with one another. And so finding the, the right balance between protecting our research assets and promoting the kind of open, internationally engaging environment is, is the real key issue here, as everyone is, is well aware of. And in some sense, it's kind of like a constrained optimization problem. You know, we number one, we don't want to burden researchers and institutions and funding agencies with a lot of additional red tape. There's already 42 to 44 percent of time spent by faculty on, on federal grants uh, spending time on administrative activities unrelated to research. It's a very, very large number. We don't want to overreact as a country and tie our hands unnecessarily because other countries scare us or threaten us. And basically, they don't have to do a whole lot. Just watch us scramble around and create all kinds of policies that really make it very, very difficult for us to achieve uh, bold thinking and bold goals. Locking everything down is not the answer either, um, but we can't ignore the challenges. And, and we certainly cannot play uh, win the game, be a leader by playing defense. And Penn State's a great football school. Oh, he's a football school. We know that you don't score and you don't win ball games by playing defense. So we really have to understand these significant risks and realize that they're not isolated, but we, we also need to know more about them. So the one thing I think we really have going for us in this country is integrity and the values that are fundamentally at the core of what we do as scholars. Without them, research simply cannot exist. There are a lot of other social institutions that promote values. They talk about values and things like that, but they can, frankly, get by with, with doing certain things. In research, because we're self-policing, we simply cannot survive and be successful if, in fact, we do not adhere to these key values. And so one of the things that I think we need to do is to teach these, these uh, uh, values. We need to model them. We need to reinforce them to our students, to next generation. We actually need to lead with them. A lot of the individuals who come here from other countries did not grow up in the same value system, and, and that's not their fault. Um, so we have a great opportunity here in America to lead with the values, to teach them the values, help them understand how to operate within the norms of those values, and also understand the consequences, which are just the same for us as it is, as it is for anyone from another country. If we violate those, those rules and those ethical um, standards, there's an important price to pay. And so the values, of course, are very important. There are things like openness and transparency and accountability and honesty and impartiality and, and objectivity. They're foundational to research. Mutual respect and collegial debate uh, where you say, if you're interested in, in doing research, we welcome you. We, we don't care what your political persuasion is. We don't care what your gender identity is. We value you because there is intrinsic value in human beings and coming together to do research is really, really critical. We have freedom of inquiry. We have reciprocity where we allow people to access our facilities and certainly merit-based competition. So, you know, we're not perfect in all those things. We fall short on diversity and equity and inclusion in a lot of cases, but we're really working hard to improve those things. So in many ways, what I just mentioned, <clears throat> those things comport with our American values. And so when we created NSPM 33, we looked at a behavior-based approach, uh, really thinking about an individual's responsibility as a scholar 
and really focusing on what is their responsibility to ensure that we do operate with integrity in the enterprise. And certainly, as Dennis mentioned, a part of that in NSPM 33 is disclosing information, which can be an incredible burden. But we have capabilities now such as digital persistent identifiers and so on that make that a lot easier. So I think the key thing here is to balance the protection of our capabilities and our knowledge and our intellectual property and so on with the openness that Dr. Weiss rightly mentioned is absolutely foundational to the success of our research enterprise and also to uh, to the world. And I can tell you that no one I've ever talked to when I was at the White House would say, oh, yes, I want somebody in my research group who knowingly breaks the rules. Um, you know, we, we folks need to know what the norms are. And and that's all well and good. We can talk about the philosophy and stuff, but at the end of the day, it comes down to at universities like OU and like Penn State, people having to make decisions about, do I collaborate with this individual? Do I have this visitor come? Do we develop this partnership? Uh, there's a talent or recruitment program or whatever it's called. Do Is it okay to participate in that? There are real boots on the ground decisions that need to be made. And the question is, do universities have the capability or the responsibility to do that? And so you may know in the Chips and Science Act, um, there was this idea of creating this thing. It's got a long acronym, Research, Security, and Integrity Information Sharing Analysis Organization, right? Um, well, really, it's, it's basically a risk assessment center primarily for academia. And the idea is to provide resources to universities and to others to make assessments to, to manage the sorts of risks that we face. Um, as, as Dr. Weiss rightly pointed out, most people operate with integrity. Uh, universities are not rife with, with all kinds of mismanagement and all kinds of challenges, but there are exploitations going on. And so the one thing I would say is this has to be a partnership among all the sectors, including the intelligence community and law enforcement. And I'll tell you what, when I was at the White House and even, even before that, I found them to be extremely helpful and also really having a desire to understand how we work in universities. You know, the academic, academic culture is an interesting animal and not everybody just gets it. So they have a strong desire, we have a strong desire. And I think we, we really need to make sure that, that they have a good understanding of who we are, how we work and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, as we, we think about spinning up this risk assessment center and some of the other things that are in the CHIPS Act um, and training and education activities, training modules and so on, research security programs, we wanna make sure that we, we do that in a way that really minimizes the, the unfortunate uh, administrative overhead that that's going to place on our researchers. And we really have to protect things that need to be protected, And but we also need to make sure that we do have an open environment to the extent that that is possible. And, and that's a really, really important thing and, and really to be helpful to universities. So I'll just close by, by saying, I think the one thing we have going for us, probably one of the most unique social constructs in this, in this country are our values, because they're fundamental to the conduct of research. And if we if we fail on those values, research stops. No one can trust research, health research, you know, development of vaccines, whether it's engineered systems, whether it's AI, whatever it is. If we start giving away our values, it's game over. So if we think about building research security and integrity on the fundamental foundation of values and we talk about them, we message them, we model them for, for the next generation, and we, we include people, we value people, we respect people, we debate like crazy, but at the end of the day, we go out and we have a beer and a pizza together, then I think we begin to solve some of the broader challenges facing our nation. And I really think the research enterprise has a tremendous opportunity to do that. So I really look forward to the discussion. I'm so grateful to be here. Dennis, thank you for the invitation. And Dr. Weiss, it's such an honor to be here with you. And I look forward to the next uh, hour and a half here. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we got off to a really great start and a lot of uh, issues put right on the table. So let, let, me, let me ask you this. I think it's clear to most people uh, the security dimension of protecting our, our research system uh, and uh, you know guarding against theft of IP and things of that sort. But uh, the kinds of things you talked about, uh, Dr. Drogemeyer in particular, with respect to integrity, um, one wonders how how are those things actually put under threat? Um, what is it about the behavior of other individuals that are coming here, or even maybe even some Americans as well, um, that are really putting the, uh, the, the issue of integrity right front and center? Because I, I hear your passion in talking about this. Um, and so it, it's something that most people, I think, haven't really thought much about. And maybe we can, uh, the two of you can give some comments about this, the integrity dimension a little bit more. That's a great point, Edison. Thank you for that. You know, integrity, I think, has multiple dimensions to it. I think 
foundational to integrity is to is to think about operating with honesty and and openness and following the the really the norms of research that as we as we understand them um and and if you are for example designing experiments doing so in a way that they're they become irreproducible or whatever and you do it because you simply didn't understand how to design the experiment one could say well that's a violation of of research integrity or the foundational principles of research um, and, and it may well be the case, but it's unintentional. So I think there are intentional violations, knowingly breaking the rules. There are unintentional violations. And, and this is something I think we've worked hard to help Congress understand that if, if research results are, are not reproducible, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's some nefarious intent. And this is why I think uh, teaching uh, individual scholars uh, to look at research methods, my own discipline in meteorology, we don't, we don't teach research methods. And of course, in so social behavioral sciences, that's the foundation, you know, so I think we have to really have a conversation about that. And the National Academies has a wonderful report, of course, on research integrity, but I think, I think it intertwines very strongly with research security, because a lot of the, a lot of the things that we see, a lot of the challenges are people breaking the rules that are really violations of policy, they're not really fundamentally breaking the law in a formal sense, uh, but misappropriating credit and things like that really strikes at the heart of, of just uh, the foundation of ethical behavior, just like plagiarism does. And so I think there's a there's a close linkage between the two. And so I really love the way that in this this workshop here, this uh, webinar, you brought the two together, calling it research security and integrity. They are in some sense separate, but in many ways they're intertwined. Laura, you have a comment on this? Unmute. Sure. Sorry about no, that. My, my my mouse just was not cooperating. So, uh, so Cal Calvin, you said that beautifully. Um, the whole notion of integrity. You know, we've heard about um, shadow labs being set up where 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 funding was being used in where where people were being paid twice to do the same thing. So we at Penn State actually created NSPM, you know, requests and um, that you set up a research security program. And we did that here at Penn State. And we actually put it under our Office of Research Protections and under our uh, Office of Research Integrity Office, our Research Integrity Officer, because it really is that balance of we want people to be able to engage in these international collaborations. Absolutely. That's how the best research happens. Um, but if there's, if you're crossing the line on that integrity, we want to before you get to the point where you may be crossing the line, some people just don't know, or they aren't informed, or they're they're just learning. Like you said, a lot of this is is education. A lot of it's mentorship. Some people know how to do it because they've been doing things for a long time. Um, but being able to make sure, Calvin, you said it beautifully with our value system, and our value is is conducting research transparently with openness and with um, with consistency and to the best, so that you're not hiding anything to the best of our ability, that transparency really is critical. So we created a, an Office of Research um, Protections and a Research Security Office where we're working through the whole disclosure system and we're we're having it set up in, in advance of, you know, with NSPM 33 coming out, but also with the openness of data and how we do data distribution and how all of that's going to play out. Um, so being able to share things freely and appropriately a lot of the faculty members are happy and willing to support these activities in these directions. They just don't know what to do. So what we're working very hard in our office um, to set up is guidance for the faculty so that we can make it as easy and understandable in, in a never changing times because you know every every couple of months something else comes out from the federal government that says, oh, now you have to do this. And 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 the faculty are like, I'm happy to comply. I just don't know what to do. So if we can, we, the, the Royal, we, all of us on this call and can help um, help guide what does that mean? And if we can keep, keep things consistent across federal agencies. So with the, um, the, the persistent identifier, the digital, the digital persistent identifiers, that is one, and the common CV, that goes a long way in faculty saying, here it is, you only have to do it once, it's going to be the same for all the federal agencies that you're, you're submitting to, that makes things a lot more streamlined, a lot easier, we can help coach them on what needs to be included and what doesn't need to be included in, in their submissions, so that they can keep it, um, 
manageable for we, we talked about the burden if you if you make the burden too high faculty will will leave academia and we don't want that we want we absolutely want faculty to be doing the research but we're going to help guide them along the way so that um the, their disclosure of current and pending and other support is consistent with our values and what we've we've been discussing all, all morning or all afternoon here now well, let me let me uh, just kind of get us uh, into a broader uh, perspective and say, uh, where where are these problems the greatest? You know, we have we have U.S. government labs where there's research going on. Obviously, we have universities and colleges, and then we have corporate R and D and all of the operations that companies engage in. Sometimes in conjunction with universities, um, but more often not their own labs. You know, famous lab. Uh, GE uh, Labs in Niska Union, New York, and uh, used to be AT and T Bell Labs. I mean, the, these were really hotbeds of new new ideas. Are are each of these under some of these threats that we've been talking about, or is the is the problem more specific to one group than they and then to the whole slew of uh, agencies engaged in R and D? I'll go say a few things, Calvin, then I'll turn it over to you. I, I think it's across the board because, like you said, um, as universities, we are an economic development engine. Our research is 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 transitioned out of the laboratories into small businesses, into large industries. We license technology out. So it, it's a it's a connected operation ecosystem. So the awareness has to be across the board. The, the challenge is, you, you, you know, you mentioned how we we, we control information. Well, there's classified, we, we got it. There's export control. We understand that. There's ITAR, you know, we understand that. There's the, the other um, one of another designation is called CUI, controlled but unclassified information. We're understanding that. What where the the nuances and, and proprietary corporate proprietary we know how to work with trade secrets. partners right th those are trade secrets and and those are proprietary information we understand as universities we know how to work with that as well where the uncertainty comes in is how do we how do we as a, as a, as a nation as a, as a as a global partners how do we the, the fundamental research that we want to continue and and ensure you know is, is this is what's providing us optimism in, for humankind because we know there's some great research advances out there and we want those to continue. How do we do that in this time where there's a lot of uncertainty as to what should be protected, but we don't even know how to define what should be protected? How do we protect it? What does protection even mean? What should be protected? What shouldn't be protected? All of those interactions um, are not clear right now. And I think just, you know, as a society, we're and, and our colleagues, all of us, we're trying to work through that so that once we come with a clear definition, we can then push that out to the faculty in a concise way so they know what to be doing and what not to be doing. So the, the trick is making it concise, precise, and um and, and actionable and implementable. Uncertainty is what what causes some of the confusion right now and the dis, the, 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 the concerning the efforts. Great. Uh, that she said that so well, that is so spot on. And I would simply add that I think sometimes the challenges are somewhat different across the sectors. You know, you look at you look at the theft of intellectual property uh, for things that have been developed and are now sort of uh, maybe at commercially at scale or whatever. That's going to happen mostly within the private sector, I would say. Whereas you look at universities, they're much more on the fundamental research side. So these these basic ideas that lead to these innovations ultimately, um, that's that's where a lot of the, the seed corn, of course, is. And so I think there's a, a different sort of interest. And, and some countries have not invested nearly heavily as heavily as we had, not even close in terms of fundamental research. So mining those those nuggets from our research, our fundamental basic research enterprise is a, is a great value proposition for them and not having to make those investments and maybe investing much more heavily on the applied side. So that puts the university sort of in the crosshairs. Plus, having uh, your foreign nationals on campus, in some some cases, uh, we've seen that uh, there are certain types of pressures brought to bear to to influence campus culture and and things like that, even influence campus policies. And and those are not just you know everywhere happening all the time, but we have seen some of those things. So I think it's somewhat different in academia and industry. And then you look at government laboratories. Now there are, of course, rules where uh, you cannot be part of any type of foreign talent program if you're a federal government employee. You look at, say, for example, the DOE labs, those are run by contractors. So a lot of those individuals are not federal. They're, they're contract employees, but they have to operate with the same rules. 
So Laura's absolutely right. You know, we we have to know what the what the rules of the game are, and we don't really know that yet. But we can't you know build huge fences around uh, really really broad areas. We've got to build tall fences around very narrow areas and leave the rest of it without fences to the extent that we possibly can. And it's got to be made, as she said, so so well understandable. The fact that we have to have these these specific plans. And uh, if there are individual questions or other things like that, there have to be resources that universities go to because they are not designed, universities are not designed to address some of the challenges we're talking about here. They simply don't have the data. It's not in the remit of an institution to do that. And, and when I went around the country at OSTP and was giving these, um, in fact, Rebecca Kaiser and I and others doing this talking to universities, the one thing we consistently heard was, um, this is not our job. It's the federal government's job so that when folks come to campus or we we have these these relations we want to build, you've got to tell us whether or not it's it's something that we should do. We don't want you to make the decision that the risk decision is on us, but we don't have the means to do this. We need help. And that, I think, is where Congress responded in the um, Ships Plus Science Act to create this information sharing organization. It's not a silver bullet at all, but I think it is an important step forward to provide resources that universities can use to make the kinds of decisions that Laura faces every day as the vice uh, vice, pre vice pre president, or vice chancellor at uh, at Penn State, where she's oversees a massive, massive operation, and uh, those decisions are important because the reputational uh, value is is critically important, and also certainly national security interests are, are at play as well. So we we've seen you know you you, you mentioned about understanding. Uh, universities and their research function and how research occurs. Both of you have talked a little bit about that. Um, over the last uh, three, four years, uh, uh, both the FBI and the intelligence community have really become uh, sort of stepped up their activities. They, they've spent time with AAU and APLU talking about these threats. They've uh, stepped up their activity on campuses. Uh, and I'm sure uh, each of you in your respective roles probably may even have had a knock on the door from the friendly uh, uh, local office of uh, one of these agencies. What is their uh, chief concern? I mean, in other words, so something seemed to provoke it. Maybe it happened uh, during the Trump administration in particular. Um, or is this sort of a kind of like a lot of hyperbole, uh, one or two bad apples in the barrel, you know, have really now, you know, created a uh, a sense of urgency. And it doesn't mean that there's no problem. It just means that have we blown this out of proportion? And I think that, you know, uh, do, do you really believe the risks are proportionate to what's being asked of universities uh, in order to respond and to protect, you know, the so-called crown jewels? Well, I, I'll just jump in and say, I think the risks are significant. I think a lot of what we see here is really violation of policy and not violation of the law. And I think we've seen some cases dismissed in the DOJ and, and so on. So um, I think it's 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 fairly pervasive, but it's pervasive in the sense of people not knowing what the rules are and, and maybe in some cases failing to disclose intentionally and, and so on. And one of the things I was pushing hard on in the White House was to say, let's let's have a grace period here. Let's give people a chance because there's sort of two dimensions to this. One is an enforcement dimension. Let's, let's you know, Let's let's prosecute. Let's whatever. But on the other hand, we have to we have to teach people. And I think again, leading with our values is what we as America can do. And, and so I think that's that's really important. But I, I do think this is a is a real issue. I think the relationships between the um, the FBI and universities is is quite good. I mean, uh, we've seen uh, campuses develop strong relationships with local offices. But the problem is there aren't that many local offices. So. Um, you, you know, I think this is where the FBI and, and CBP and groups like that really need to continue to work with universities and have these dialogues and so on. Uh, and I've had questions asked of me. And, and again, it's sort of you notice when things don't seem to be right. And that seems to me from what I can tell of what what, uh, you know, what these kinds of agencies are interested in is not coming and trying to, you know, say, you know, we're, we're hunting people down, but it's more um, have you noticed things that don't seem to be quite right? And, and if so, can we be helpful? And and I think again, uh, this has to be a partnership, and it's all about trust. And, and I think that trust has frankly grown a lot. And I think I, I kudos to the FBI in particular, who I think have worked very very hard to build meaningful relationships with agencies. Because it used to be, you know, an FBI agent knocks on your door, you call the legal counsel, and you lock your door, and you say, I can't talk to you. You know, I mean, that's that's simply how it was. Those those days are gone. And I think the trust is 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 building up better now. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, I want to say that the trust apps, at least from with our campuses, the trust is absolutely building up better. It, it's more of a 
Um, let's let's start the conversation early before the FBI goes and knocks on anyone's door. We don't want to get to that point. So if they if they see something concerning, they can come have a conversation with us and then let us. You know, there's always two sides to every story. You know, so, you know, you don't, whatever you're hearing, you're only hearing half the story. Um, so we get the opportunity to explain what they're hearing or seeing so that we can review it. And um, if something is not accurate or not correct, then we get the opportunity to, to set that record straight. And, and if that that's the kind of partnership that is critical. That will also go a long way if faculty know that we're watching um, out for them in, in these situations so that they they, they don't have to sleep in fear at night that someone's going to come knocking on their door. To the best we can, we want to be able to have those conversations with with the FBI and other local authorities well in advance, um, you know, that, that before something, especially if there's a lot of unknowns. So give, give, give us the opportunity to help clarify things, to explore things where appropriate. And, and, and that, you know, pr protecting, you know, th this culture of compliance, um, everybody supports that. They just need to know how and what, just, just what Kelvin said, this is new to a lot of people. We're coming out of, you know, some times where, you know, it used to be faculty members would, you know, had had a, had a very long leash and free reign to go do what we want, them, what, what they want to do. And now the 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 sponsors, the federal agencies, at least in particular, are 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 starting to say, well, wait, we have more more compliance and more regulations you need to follow. And, and faculty who who've been in their these careers for you know 10, 20, 30, 40 years are all of a sudden being told they have to do something differently. It, it takes a little bit of time to to. Um, to communicate and retrain and, and and have them learn some new practices on what what they can and should um, be doing and and that's the, kind of that grace period that you were talking about kelvin people didn't know if they were doing anything right or wrong they're, they're looking for guidance they're looking for direction and they're willing to comply because they recognize that this, this culture of compliance really is protects the scientific research community it protects everyone and it protects you know the federal government it protects individual researchers it protects their international collaborators so for all of us to have these international relationships disclosed and vetted and determine if there's any potential conflict of interest, conflict of commitment, duplication of research or diversion of intellectual property, that's what we're just, that was, that was you know, funded by the federal government. That's what we're pr predominantly talking about now. Um, industry is also starting to have a similar um, tone in, in the conversations that we have with industry, but, but this is in everyone's best interest. It's just, it's, it's a little bit different than what many people who've been in the in academia for, for their whole career are used to and that's the transition we're working through right now i hope everybody takes what laura just said and prints a transcript and puts it on their wall because she said it so well this is about empowering researchers protecting the entire enterprise it's not about trying to slap people down or make life difficult life is different now we're trying to empower and frankly if we're going to be a leader in the world, we have to actually open things up and we've got to invest much more. And we've got to, we can't change the risk profile, but we can change the investment profile. And if we do that, as she was saying here, and just talking about helping people be successful, that's what this is really about. I just hope everyone really listens to what she just said, because it was, it, it just put it all together right there. Great. Well, NSPM, and then in January of this year, the, the guidance that was issued, they talked about four or four areas that need to be, you know, uh, stepped up attention, uh, cybersecurity, foreign travel security, research security training, and export control uh, training. Those seem to be four priority areas. Um, as you attend to those, um, are you finding that uh, um you are in some ways constraining researchers uh, that they're kind of feeling, oh no, uh, as as Kelvin said, more red tape, more bureaucracy, more reporting requirements, not worth it. I'm, I'm going home. You know, uh, I, I, you know, this is a big concern because everyone wants to know, are these things in the end of the day going to short circuit our research uh, creativity, uh, the innovative entrepreneurial drive of people, uh, because it's just too cumbersome at the end, end of the day. And uh, uh, these four areas seem to be, I mean, they're reasonable when you think about them, but it's just another amount of layers upon layers and layers of, of things. If you, uh, like Kelvin, you said 40%, I wrote down 40% of the time 
uh, that you spend in dealing with a federal grant is spent on administrative, uh, you know, activity. You know, that's a lot of time. And now we've just added all of these reporting requirements. I, I remember a few years ago when I was going to China, we were told, don't bring your main computer, you know, bring a, a blank computer, uh, you know, because we know that there have been attempts to uh, uh, violate, you know, the, those those devices. And so we did that. But th that was sort of a minor inconvenience, not a major one. These these seem to involve much more. So I'm I'm wondering, what are you feeling on your campuses in terms of the impact? Okay, I'll I'll, I'll chime in a little bit here. Um, you, you talked about training, and this is a, a a big area of concern of faculty burden because. Every, you, you identified four areas and every one of them, you know, export control, cyber, um, what did you have, research security? Foreign travel and foreign research travel. security. Right. So, so those are just train. And, and, and what is our, what do what universities, this is something Penn State's looking at, by the way. Um, all these universities say, well, let's give you a training program. You take, you know, two hours of training and then you'll be, you'll be good. But those were just four areas you identified. There is so much training that's going on on campuses, not just in the research security area, in, in financial operations, and in, in how you how you man, manage finances, in how you do hiring and recruiting. There, there's, there is so much training right now that everyone says, well, it's just a two-hour module. Those two-hour modules, you know, throughout the whole year, just continue to 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 add and add and add, and faculty do get tired of it. And they, and, they, and they question, is it even effective? So the, the real question, what, what we're exploring, are there better ways to communicate the importance of everything we're talking about here without it being yet another training module that's added onto a requirement for to be able to accept this contract, you have to have had training in fill in the blank. Um, so what we're exploring is, are there better ways to, to teach faculty, actually, pushing it all the way down to the undergraduate level. So being able to have students start learning as undergraduates, some of these, these training, uh, these, these um, practices that we need to have in place, um, graduate students, postdocs, so that by the time you know, you're know you at the faculty level and, and, and the faculty are now mentoring, it's the same with lab, let me just give you another, it's, it's very similar to how we work in labs. So how do you train somebody to work in a laboratory a lot of it is mentorship it is it, you know there is obviously some training that you have to go on how to, to do a technique or how to write a standard operating procedure how to do design of experiments but a lot of it is really mentorship type of training if we can switch um, the the approach that we have for um, imposing these practices on people so that they do learn how to do them but but not have it be a training module that would go a long way because right now it does feel like a burden and we don't want faculty to be discouraged. We want them to know the information and, and be well-versed in this, but we don't want them to be discouraged. And if the answer is in order to get this federal contract, you need to have a two hour training on the following, that's not going to help. That is, that's more discouraging than, than effective. And let me just ask of the four I mentioned, uh, uh, let's just take Penn State as the example, uh, of any of those areas been particularly you know, burdensome, uh, you know, as opposed to some of the others? I, I think it's the collective burden. Right. It, it's it just one more thing added, one more thing added, one more thing added constantly. Okay. Yeah, and you know, in, 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 in this country in particular, I think a lot of times we tend to shoot the, uh, the, the water and the fire hose above the tips of the flames instead of at the base of the fire. And so every every problem that comes along we have a singular solution for it rather than trying to address what the underlying issues are and laura said it so well i mean foundationally it, it's helping people understand the the ethos of what the research what the whole research notion is about the the behavior based you know ethics and rules and things but it's not even rules it, as she said it's mentoring it's where you talk about you know you construct the experiment this way but here's why you do that let's talk about why we're doing it this way, the importance of transparency, openness, reproducibility, all these kinds of things. Once you build that foundation, like raising a child, then they start to do the right things versus you got to teach them to do the right thing on every single thing they do. Well, forget it. There's no way you could possibly do that. And then, you know, when you look at China in particular, it's it's sort of the wild, wild west. And that's what's attractive to people. I've talked to my own colleagues who've gone over there like, we get lots of money. There's no burdens. There's no rules. We just get to do research. Well, okay, that's that's true, but there's a flip side to that, right? And that's not something that we have in this country. So in some sense, we're our own worst enemy 
because we have so much focus on integrity and everything, but it's that's not a bad thing. What we do is it's how we how we in, implement the integrity, how we actually do integrity. And, and Laura's right. If you have a training program for every little thing, it just it's going to be just you're going to be crushed by it. So we have to pull back, I think, and get to the base foundation of what do we really need to have to operate with integrity and security. And some of these other things, then you say, well, we don't really need that anymore because that's not an issue. Does that make sense? I don't know if I came across quite right, but that that's hopefully that makes sense. No, no, it does. Um, let me remind our audience just first that if you have a question, please uh, submit it through the Q&A function and we'll get to those in a, in a few minutes. Um, let, let me talk about internationalization on U.S. campuses, because at the heart and soul of what a university is about, uh, uh, most of the, uh, at least the American universities over the last 10 years have embraced the idea of becoming internationalized. Uh, and that is really, as some of you, both of you indicated, has prompted this almost a strong desire or an imperative uh, to look for par foreign partners, foreign collaborators, et cetera. Uh, the way new knowledge is uh, created these days are through these transnational knowledge networks, not through sort of stay at home lab uh, behaviors. Uh, and so, you know, we, we've entered a, a whole new period of how knowledge is created. Uh, is this is this all going to, in a sense, detract from that? Um, I'm hearing from some of the so-called SIOs, uh, senior international officers, the vice provosts of international, uh, that they're sensing a reticence among the leadership that the, this, the, the ground is very, very shaky about engaging overseas. And uh, it's probably safer just to uh, adopt a minimalist uh, approach right now until we're really sure what the lay of the land is going to look like. Um, I, don't, I don't know, not just your universities. Um, have you thought about that bigger ramification of what we're doing in terms of that drive or that imperative for international? Laura, you want to start? I was going to let Calvin go first this time. Okay. I'll follow. Okay, great. Well, um, I think there is a reticence, and I think we're we're on a on a dangerous slope because I think there's there's sort of two views of this. One is from looking from from the U.S. outside and from the outside into the U.S. You know, are do people want to come and you know work here and collaborate here? Are they welcome? Uh, what are the issues and and so on? I think uh, the best way to uh, to address that is to go go do it and, and, and be bold and, and, and do it in a thoughtful way, do it in a way that um, where you, you you basically know who you're working with. I mean, banks don't give loans to people if they don't vet them. So it's not unheard of and it's not inappropriate to do certain vetting for certain kinds of things. Uh, but I think I think those collaborations are terribly important. And and one of the points that uh, the recent National Academies report uh, on strengthening um, the I think I forget exactly the title, but strengthening innovation in America, whatever, uh, was the fact that we have all these platforms, these new platforms, whether it's things like CRISPR, whether it's it's uh, social media platforms, whether it's cloud platforms, all these there are all these shared platforms, and they're they're inherently multinational. So when you're thinking about collaboration, and doing things, it's almost impossible not to be multinational in the activities that you're you're undertaking. So I think the key thing is we've got to provide, as Laura said, the resources for individuals institutions to make decisions about who they partner with or whatever and then just just go do it and make you can't de-risk it completely but you can you can manage the risk which is the key thing and manage conflicts and things like that and we have to go show it i mean people are not going to be convinced that that america wants to be the go-to place that we want to address these issues if we simply put a lot of policies together and people are too timid to do it so i think we need to have programs at NSF and other places that really say, look, we want to go do this. We want to have international. And here's a program that is exactly that. So go after it, you know, but but go in with your eyes open. I, I just think that's one of the ways is just let's let's do it by showing showing way. Calvin, you said that very well. We, we can't just close our borders to research um, that that will not be productive. That will not be constructive. Um, that that will that will curtail innovation. Um, we it, it, you know the, the there are brilliant minds all around the world, and we have to be you know allow our, our researchers to engage with with the best you know internationally. So we don't want to be closing borders, um, but we do need to remind our faculty that there are individuals, few and far between, but there are individuals out there who may have ulterior motives. So. So 
you know, if you have a long-standing collaboration with someone you've known for 20 years, something's probably hasn't changed. Um, and that's probably fine. But if you're starting a new collaboration, you might want to go in with you know, your eyes wide open and then have the conversations just to just to be aware. So under for there's an awareness. But then once you're you're comfortable that the the um, your collaborator, your international collaborator is operating with integrity and according to our value system, then we need to embrace that and, and encourage it. We're, that that is critical for innovation and, and scholarly advances. Um, so so we yeah, I, I don't think clamping down is the right answer. I think doing things in a more educated, um, aware, making the collaborations be aware is, is what is important. And then once you find those collaborators that you've been working with, though those are long-term relations that we have globally. If you think about the, the global network of collaborations that goes on across universities, um, it, it's, tr it's tremendous. It's really impressive. And so let's just try to um, encourage that and um, and and that, that's how that's how the advances will be made we need our international collaborations and partners just as we do with other with you know the state department and with with other types of policy that that is that happens you know worldwide research isn't different well you know an, another another term that is uh, you know uh, as part of this equation is globalization because globalization has meant lower you know uh, uh fences in terms of the movement of information movement of people movement of ideas across borders and cultures all around the world but some people have suggested that perhaps uh, a kind of techno nationalistic streak is emerging in the united states that is, is creating a process of deglobalization in other words uh, or fractured globalization as some have suggested and that the united states is actually almost single-handedly uh, creating the conditions to reshape uh, this open global environment and giving uh, you know uh, other countries the idea that maybe they too need to be more cautious and therefore we've got a kind of global tightening. Um, are, you, are you seeing that at all you know in terms of the the outreach by your colleagues and uh, the responses that they're getting from other universities and in different places around the world or or are they as open as ever? You know, I think the pendulum has has was was, was all, all on one side before, and now then it swung to the a little bit more extremeness. And I think it's starting to settle down. We're seeing lots of national collaborations and partnerships happening. Um, COVID didn't help because we we restricted travel during COVID, so it was it's kind of this. Um, Two two different activities: COVID restricting travel, and then this 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 awareness of what do we want to do with proliferation of our our technologies. Um, those kind of happen at the same time, but but I, I don't think they were meant to 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 align. So really, um, that that closing down with travel was just a, an unfortunate timing. But I, I'm, we're, we are seeing, you know, our faculty engage with their international collaborators um, as, as they were before. Now that travel has opened up and loosened up, people are going around to international conferences. They're really engaging, and I think that's the right thing to do. So you're, you're, you're optimistic that we're going to return to a pre-COVID level or have the base conditions changed enough from a political point of view that uh, we may not be able to get back there? I, I, I think it's going to settle down somewhere in the middle. I, okay. I, I think I'm, I'm optimistic. I am optimistic, um, but but I just think we're, I'm optimistic. But we need to again let our our faculty, our researchers, our scholars know um, just awareness. We we have to 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 teach them and mentor them and 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 help them with awareness, and then they'll be able to you know go forth and and prosper. I would completely agree with that. I think she's spot on. And when I would meet with um, my counterparts when I was at OSTP, you know, science ministers, science advisors, whatever, from other countries, one of the very first things they wanted to talk about was research security. Uh, but from the point of view of we want to open things up, we don't want to see it be closed down. So how do we make sure that it is open? So I think Laura's reading the tea leaves exactly right. I think that there was a time when, when yeah, there was this tightening or whatever, but I think things are relaxing a lot now. I think people are, are much more comfortable now. 
But as she said, if we provide the guidance and the resources needed, we can thoughtfully know who we're working with or whatever. And by doing that over time, I think people will say, okay, we can both have this open enterprise that we want, a principled international collaboration, and we could also be protecting some of our key assets. But, but we have to be very thoughtful and strategic about what we protect. We don't just want to put a blanket over everything. And that, that's an easy solution, but it's not the right solution. Hmm. So um, among among the countries that seem to be so-called problem countries, China obviously has been singled out uh, as the biggest threat to the security and the integrity of the U.S. research system. And I just came back uh, from spending a month in China, and uh, I, I can't tell you how many times uh, uh, that subject that came up. You know, why us and why why all the attention, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, are there other countries uh, uh, that uh, provide uh, or at least uh, offer a similar threat? I mean, is it just a China problem? Because it seems that a lot of the legislation and regulation, um, whether we like it or not, seems to be China directed. The Chips and Science Act, many of those provisions and other things that were enacted uh, during the previous administration. Um, are there other countries that we need to be cautious about? I know that we allow graduate students from Iran to come in the United States. We've had Russian you know, students, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, or or is is this really a distinctly China problem? I'll, 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 so I go back to like maybe I didn't say this so clearly at the beginning. We, we're sitting here talking about countries, but collaborations are between are among individuals. Mm -hmm. And it really goes back to um, awareness of who the individuals are that you're who you're collaborating with. And if the individuals you're collaborating with are transparent and they have the values that Kelvin so so beautifully uh, enunciated earlier on, if the value systems align, if they're working with integrity, then 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 we can proceed and we should proceed. That's that comes back to the transparency, the integrity, the honesty, the 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 disclosure. Um, so it's more about individuals instead of targeting countries. Um, I, I think you just need to choose your individual collaborators appropriately so that they have the same values and similar values that which which we hold so dearly to us in our research um, establishment. And that is so right, Laura, and so beautifully said. And that's why in, in NSPM 33 and, and other things that we did, we said it's about foreign government influence, not about foreign influence, because the individuals as she said, you know, they, they operate with integrity or whatever. And and in, in some sense, they're the ones who are in the crosshairs because they're under all kinds of pressure. Uh, if, you know, their families are back, say, for example, in China and, and so on, those who are, you know, so pressured. But, but you know, back in the days of the Soviet Union, some of the greatest work in, in turbulence theory came out of Soviet Union collaborations with the United States, regardless of the Cold War, you know. So, uh, so absolutely true. And, and I think it's, you know, I think truly, you know, China being the economic power it is and, and its military ambitions, it's not being in any way uh, uh, intransparent about it, what it wants to do. It's it's, it's very open it, about its ambitions and more so than ever before. And it doesn't hide it. Russia is a different animal. I think Russia is very different economically, obviously, but has strong military ambitions. Iran is Iran. And then you've got North Korea which I think, you know, you look at the universities in Iran and North Korea, they're very, very different. Iran's got, you know, some really great universities and some good work going on there. North Korea, who really knows? So I think that the threats are really different. But I I think, you know, this is where I think that the challenge comes in terms of those who are ethnically Chinese feel targeted and so on. And I think that, again, the point about the research environment is where you bring people together with common values, solving pro common problems, and, and you know, everybody is 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 united in that way and that's that's how we re really can show the value but there are going to be people who are ethically chinese who are targeted who are who are uh, in in various ways marginalized and maligned and things like that but we just have to push push against that and it's as corny as it sounds let the good overtake the bad and in research enterprise and laura said this so well earlier there aren't that many bad actors there certainly are some more than most people realize but but the the bulk of folks are not and and so that's a very powerful very powerful uh tool to to push back against some of the malign activities that are happening china is not going to change it's simply not uh, and these other countries aren't going to change their cultures or anything like that but what we can do is use our our values and really promote those and bring people into the fold. And I think doing that one by one, as Laura said, that's how research advances. And we should never apologize for doing that. 
Well, and I know I think it's a really good point because if you actually look at the changes that have occurred in China over the last 30, 40 years, the first, uh, the concept of comprehensive research universities comes from the US experience and its impact on China. China's uh, uh, decision to create a, what they call their National Natural Science Foundation, comes from the experience of interacting with the US NSF. So, you know, people who talk about disengagement or delinking are ignoring all the benefits that come from engagement in order of establishing what you call, you know, we call the integrity, the values, the norms, et cetera. It's rather, it's, it's disconcerting because we lose a key channel of influence if we, if we, if we delink. Um, but let, let's go a little bit further. There, there are reports now coming into the, into the uh, public about uh, the, uh, the number of Chinese American scientists and postdocs, you know, who have been working in the U.S. are now considering returning back to China because of the of the rise of some combination of racism, uh, suspicion about uh, their activities, uh, and the limitations that implicit or explicit have seemed to be placed on their behavior. Um, I know I had mentioned to Laura at a, a National Academy meeting, um, a, a number of people who've talked about going to third countries so that they can still continue to engage with both the US and China and not put their careers at risk in some, in some ways. Um, this you know, would be highly detrimental to the United States if we had a, maybe it won't be a mass uh, departure, but a, a significant departure of people you know, just simply because they feel uncomfortable and pol politically insecure. Um, do you think, we, we mentioned about the China initiative and its termination, but do we still have policies in place that seem to be creating this uneasiness? Uh, and that's why this uh, momentum about perhaps returning has not gone away. What else do you think we can do to kind of uh, uh, interrupt this and, and give the, uh, this group as a as a group, you know, more more sense of of comfort and security that they're not uh, uh, looked at with, uh, you know, the, the suspicion just because of their ethnic background? Tough question, I know, no easy answer. Go ahead, Laura, feel free. Oh, I was going to let you go first. <laughs> Oh, you no. really do. Want me? <laughs> okay. I, I really do. Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. Um, with regard to policies, <clears throat> you know, I think messaging matters a lot, um, especially, frankly, on social media. And I think a lot of times the messaging gets gets skewed a little bit to where things are not nearly as bad as, as they seem. I mean, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day um, at a Midwest university, and they said, you know, the the, the uh, social media tends to get a me megaphone more to the extremes than it does to sort of the, the, the middle of the middle part, which is much, much bigger. But people do pay attention to that. And these these are real issues. I've seen papers and talked to people about them in terms of chi ethnically Chinese individuals, Chinese nationals, especially or Asians, maybe more broadly, feeling very uncomfortable. Um, I think the only way to really sort of reverse that, there's multiple dimensions to it. I think one is messaging from the highest levels of, of the U.S. government uh, that, you know, we, we want you to come here, study here and stay here. Uh, that's very important. There have to be maybe some visa reforms where we make it easier. I know the UK has done this. Uh, when I was in the White House, they did some really, really cool things. I think Canada as well. So there's some policy things that you can do. Uh, so messaging policy, and then certainly, I think at universities where the rubber meets the road, uh, the problems are probably less severe, although I know there are some challenges that universities have. But I think uh, folks like Laura do a tremendous job of of the you know the cultures of the institutions to make sure that these these folks really do feel valued and there are certain activities on campus and things that can happen there to make sure that that becomes a a, a community you know and so the, the other thing we have to be a little, little careful of you know there are organizations on our campuses there's a Chinese student organization and all the different student organizations which I think is fantastic because they obviously share their their ethnicity and their bond but we have to also make sure that we have this sort of integration and assimilation across all the disciplines because we can all learn from one another and folks like Laura I think do a tremendous job promoting that sort of thing we probably maybe need to say are we doing enough of that you know to really help so I think there's got to be national messaging at the top levels national policy and also uh, you know at, at universities really redoubling efforts to to not only make people feel welcome and belonging but also have programs to where that actually happens in a meaningful way and 
you know, I, I could say this at the end, but I'll just say it now. I think, you know, I wrote this little thing in my book as the afterword that research does three things. It, 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 it inspires us tremendously. It unites us and it also guides us. And we could talk about the pandemic, you could talk about anything. So inspiring gets us together, uniting us across, you know, whatever, but there are folks who who are marginalized because of their ethnicity, but we, we I think, can address that. And then guiding us through the research outcomes like, uh, you know, rapid vaccine development and so on. <clears throat> That's what it does. We need to talk about that more. We, we don't say this enough to people to where they step back and see the forest through the trees. They're just focused on their research problem. But like Laura said, that it's not just the training, it's the mentoring, the day by day. Somebody who's a sexual harasser can do a two-hour module on sexual harassment. It won't change them a bit, but if they have an environment that continually reinforces the, 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 the insidious nature of sexual harassment, they're more likely to not do it than if they just simply take a training session. So anyway, long answer, I should shut up and give it over to Laura, who's got much better perspective on this than I do. Oh, no, you hit it right on. Yeah, inspiring, uniting, and guiding. That is, that's, those are three great words, um, actions and, and, and philosophies that, that really are important to our faculty. Um, the inspiring piece. Okay, so let me, back, let me back up for a minute. Dennis, you asked whether or not we're seeing uh, or we're concerned that, that many of our faculty and researchers will either go back to other countries or, or, or not even come here from other countries and are we doing ourselves a disservice? I, I think that's back to the pendulum thing. I think we we swung a little bit far and, it, and it's starting to come back. Uh, it is really in my position in universities all across the country to continue to create a welcoming environment. Um, we're working hard at that. And that will be important to, to maintain and retain individuals and attract, attract retain and maintain um, individuals at our universities and in our country. Um, we, we, again, we, it, it has to be welcoming. The inspiration piece of this, as you mentioned, Calvin, I love those three words, inspiring, uniting, and guiding. Um, when, when, you, when you collaborate with people from around the world, the, the, the intellectual engagement and inspiration is, is just tremendous. And that is what will retain or attract individuals um, because they wanna be part of that. And we want them to be part of that because that's where the best ideas come from. That brings the uniting piece to that as well. Um, but we do have to have communities on our campus also for, for individuals who, who might feel um, they're, they're being isolated for them to come forward and, and engage with others so that they, they know they're not alone. We don't want anyone to be alone in this. And then how do we guide them um, in, into ensuring that what they're doing is, is okay, it is welcoming. We, we have to keep that, that dialogue going. It, it comes back to those, those who, who want to take inappropriate actions, inappropriate diversion of intellectual property, let's find those individuals out and, and, and not embrace them, but everyone else we should be embracing. Um, and that that is critical. I, I think the pendulum will swing back, um, you know, as I mentioned, um, that's what that's what we want to, that's how we have to be moving forward. It might even be time for uh, American and Chinese universities to create some kind of consortium uh, where they establish these rules of the road going forward so that the the things that were not anticipated as problems way back when the collaborate when the cooperative agreements were signed and that have become big problems today that uh, we we try to preempt those by making you know over commitments on both sides uh to this uh, uh for the next 40 years because we've 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 had a at least over the last half dozen years a fairly rocky road from what uh it seemed to be a pretty good uh, uh, collaborative bilateral relationship. So this is interesting. We have a question from the audience about the European Union. It says, uh, the U EU has developed a concept of responsible research and innovation that focuses on the ethical impacts of research effort at an early stage. Um, how would you assess the European approach and compare it, for example, with that of the United States? Are we doing enough to anticipate uh, these ethical impacts in our research system. Why don't we Why don't we start with Laura, and we'll go to uh, Kelvin. So I I know that, uh, and I'm trying to think what the acronym is. It's COC or something that the the. But anyway, it's the it's, it's the ethical 
guidance towards research. We, we start that certainly at the graduate student level. Um, we've been talking about pushing that down to undergraduates. Um, so the responsible, maybe that's what it is, responsible conduct of research, RCR, right? maybe, and is that out of, um, uh, is that out of JCOR maybe, or? or It initially came out of the 2007 Competes Act, but in the okay. CHIPS Act now, it's not just for grad students and well, it's not just for under people funded on an SF grant, it's actually for faculty as well. That's a mandate. Right. Yeah. right. So, so that responsible conduct of research um, it is aligned with what the European Union is doing. Um, it might not be exact one to one match, but it's the same philosophy that we just need to start um, back that mentoring and training, although it's not a training module, but back to getting that message out and um, having, having people understand that early on in their training. Um, as as scholars and scientists and, and researchers. So we need to just start working it right from the beginning. And so there are groups that are working this and they're working it at the national level and having it be adopted by universities in the US you know, nationwide. I think right. APAU and APLU are doing some really good stuff there too. And I, I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm going to give a little bit of a shameless plug for a book that I have in press at MIT Press called Demystifying the Academic Research Enterprise. And it's it's all the stuff like we're just talking about here that you never really, not never, but but other parts that, that are in the book, you you don't, the only way you get it to know about it, to learn it is to simply encounter it in your career after 20 years, you finally have it. So after been in this game for almost 40 years, I put all this stuff together in a book and, and it's being published open access, totally free. You don't have to pay a dime for it. Uh, and it, it has a whole <laughs> chapter on ethical behavior, conduct, and also another chapter on compliance. And the idea is to give this to undergraduates, grad students, postdocs, early career faculty, to put all this on the front end of their career, as Laura said, exactly what we need to do. And it's just, it's written like a, a kind of a textbook in a conversational style. So it'll be out sometime, uh, I guess, the middle of this this next year. And the, the reason I am saying it, because it's free, it's it doesn't cost anything. I don't get any royalties. <laughs> it. But it's going to be, I think, a resource for exactly this, like postdoc training and grants and things like that. Great. Okay. In our final moments, let me uh, ask you sort of each one big, you know, one big question, and and that has to do with we've discussed a lot of issues all around the the idea of of security and uh, integrity. Um, but when you look at the U.S. Uh, uh, R and D performance and productivity, are we? Do you think we're focused on the right issues? Are we giving too much attention to the security issues? And should there be, uh, you know, a uh, uh, three or four other things that we should be spending our time on instead of focusing so much uh, on on the uh, on the security side. In other words, you know, what's the real Achilles heel in the U.S. R&D system today uh, and that needs to be fixed in order to get it moving in the right direction? And we have about a minute, a minute, each of you. So so um, I'll go ahead first, Calvin, just. Um, if you don't mind. So, so first off, I want to say this is a great, I, I know we're talking about research security and research integrity. And it was a pretty heavy conversation. I think this is a great time in our nation to be a researcher, especially at a university, because for the first time in decades, the U.S. government is putting some serious funding into our federal research agencies to distribute to universities, collaborating with industry. The industry university collaborations are incredible. The um, If the funding gets appropriated, certainly the CHIPS Act was, was a, a, a nice appropriation in the R&D realm. We haven't seen allocations like this in a long time. So I think it's just inspiring to be part of the research enterprise right now in our nation. We, we've, we've turned things around, you know, for the longest time, the federal investments kept going down and down or, or, or holding flat. Um, and, and that's why we saw some of this behavior where, where, where researchers were going to other countries because they thought they can get bigger amounts of money with less hassles. But now our nation is paying attention to this and they're actually putting more money back into research. And, and this is an exciting time to be in this in this area in, in the US. So I'm actually very optimistic, excited, and, and, and hope that some of these research integrity and, and um, issues are, 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 are addressable and we can put them um, in our training and mentorship and put it behind us so that it becomes a norm. And we actually get to continue moving forward on, on great advances um, in these new areas that the, the government is investing in. I'm, I'm very excited. Super, super. Kelvin? Uh, yes, and amen to that spot on. Uh, you know, the risks have gone up, but the funding hasn't. So the, the differential between the two is 
has been, you know, getting getting smaller and smaller. Now, as, as Laura said, now the funding, if, we, if there are congressional staffers on, please get, get the appropriation into CHIPS. We really need to get that across the finish line. The authorization is great, but we've got to have the money. And that will really allow us to, we want to keep de-risking, but then we're getting the investment up as well. The other thing I would say we need to do as a country is, is um, we need to think much longer term. Uh, this is something China does. They think 20, 30 years in the future. And this is something when I was at OSTP, I, I started, we didn't ever really get it going because we didn't have enough time. But we need to think 30, 50 years into the future and think about the long arc of, of where we want our country to be in the R&D innovation space, not what particular topics you can't do. I mean, I'm a meteorologist. Can you talk about a 50-year forecast? That's insane, right? But I'm talking about thinking about not the next budget cycle, the next congressional election or whatever, but thinking about Putting all that aside, let's think about where, where we want to be, what structures, what philosophies are going to guide us forward, and certainly have a five-year and a 10-year plan, but we need to have more of a 50-year horizon look, and, 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 and countries, China in particular, does that, I think, to their benefit, and so I think if we could build upon the great strength that Laura just talked about, do that as a country, I think we're ideally positioned to do that, to inspire the next generation to come in and be excited about scholarship, be excited about the future, I think we're better positioned now to do that than almost any time since World War II. So, um, so thank you so much, Dennis. Well, you've given me a, a great idea for our next uh, webinar, which is uh, what a U.S. S&T plan might look like. Um, I, I think that a lot of people have been thinking of that about that for a while, and I think uh, that's that's a great a great idea that we we ought to try to create something around that. Well, let me thank both of you. You've been just excellent in terms of being so responsive and uh, uh, and then and not afraid to take on any of the issues. And I really appreciate that. And I know our audience has done that. I want to thank the audience who has uh, uh, stayed with us uh, for the for the webinar. Uh, and I also want to thank all of the staff at the Center for Innovation Policy and our co-sponsors uh, uh, for being so. Uh, uh, helpful in terms of bringing this program together. Um, we This is our last program for, I think, for 2022. Uh, so stay tuned for next year where we will be doing more uh, on this topic. Thank you all very much and uh, have a great weekend. Bye-bye now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks so much. I did run on. Okay.